Good morning and welcome to the January 10th, 2024 meeting of the Olympic Region Clean Air Agency. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy it's good to see you. Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, do uh, introductions for the record. So I'm Jim Cooper from the city of Olympia. Uh, let's go to Greg. Hi, Greg Brotherton, Vice Chair from Jefferson County. Let's go to Mike. Mike French, Collin County Commissioner. Joan. I'll get it right here. Just hang on a minute. <laughs> I do know who I am, though. Uh, Joan Cathy, and I am from the city of Tumwater. Randy. Andy Neville and Mason County Commissioner. Jill. Jill Warney, Grace Harbor County Commissioner. Carolina. Carolina Mejia, Thurston County Commissioner, and I'm here on behalf of Commissioner Emily Klaus, who is the new representative for ORCA. And perfect timing, Robin, to introduce yourself. Hi, Robin Vasquez, City of Lacey. Great. Welcome, everyone. Jeff, can you take us through the staff? Uh, sure. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, so Jeff Johnson, ORC Executive Director. I'm joined uh, today by Robert Moody, Compliance Manager, Jennifer DeMay, uh, uh, Acting Engineering Manager, Odell Hadley, Senior Air Monitoring Specialist, Dan Nelson, our Communications Manager, um, and Zoom Master, um, Lynn Harding, Financial Services Manager. And I would also like uh, to introduce, please introduce you to Aiden Palm, uh, with us today, Aiden is Orca's newest employee. He's uh, Air Quality Specialist One, joined us last week on January 1st. Um, Aiden comes to us from DNR, um, and we're excited about making the most of those connections uh, with with our with our with one of our state partners. Um, and an interesting fact, Aiden is also a, a commercial pilot. So uh, please join me in welcoming Aiden. I don't actually see him up there. Um, uh, so I don't know if I was thinking maybe he was in the conference room, but I'm not seeing him popping up on the conference room camera. So maybe he's having trouble getting in, but. Uh, yeah, he's having trouble with the video. He's in, I think, and listening, but I think I can have him pop around here if you guys want to put a face to it. Sure. Yeah, yeah there, there we go. Yeah. Ah, there he is. Okay, good. Got him in there. So while he's logging in, we're doing an electric plane instead of an electric car then, right? <laughs> I don't know if those if those exist yet. Maybe uh, maybe using um, uh, some renewable, some 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 biofuel or something. But I don't think it can be electric quite yet. There's Aiden. There he is. There's Aiden. So Aiden, we were just uh, I was just uh, uh, welcoming you to the agency. Oh hey yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Can you guys hear me? All right. Yes, we can. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you. Appreciate it. Nice to meet you all. Welcome, Aiden. Thank you. I'm also not this pale. Uh, it looks like the camera made me look very, very pale. <laughs> right. So he's he, he, Aiden's definitely drinking from the Orca fire hose at the moment, uh, <laughs> coming up to speed on everything that inspectors, uh, that air quality specialists do around Orca, which is a lot. So very much so. I had a glitch. Did you just say that you're drinking? <laughs> no, fire hose. Hose. fire hose. Fire hose. Yeah. Oh, okay. I got it. So, Aiden, could you go up in your plane and check the air if we really had an emergency? Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Well, it depends on visibility, but yeah, definitely. <laughs> if uh, okay. they'll let me take off, I'll take off. Well, uh, mention it, uh, you know, broadcast it or something uh, among the group and uh, then charge us for a ride. You oh, yeah. Make... That'd be awesome. Yeah. That's yeah. Perfect. We'll, we'll go with you. <laughs> cool. I, I think trust already. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Carolina, what? I was like, I think Jeff is trying to sweat with the conversation right now. Yeah, the no, the lawyers, the lawyers started taking notes too. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, the other Jeff, the other Jeff, Jeff Myers, I'm the, your legal counsel, taking taking notes and figuring out ways in which we're going to cover forks now with the new uh, uh, the the new pilot. Right on. Okay, well, welcome everyone. I'm looking for a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. Second. 
Okay, I got a motion in a couple seconds. Uh, any amendment? All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Oh, opposed? Anyone opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, that takes us to the chair report. Uh, just I have uh, two quick items, and then I'll turn it over to Greg for the um, the finance committee update. Um, first of all, I wanted to just let folks know that next month, uh, per our bylaws, it's my responsibility to appoint the finance committee for the rest of the year to go through the budget cycle. And so um, if anybody's interested in being on the finance committee, uh, please let me know or let Jeff Johnson know. Um, the current committee is Greg is the chair, Randy and I are committee members, and Jill is our alternate. Um, with the size of that, it, you know, if you're interested in learning more about Orca Finance, you know, you, you know, all of us are willing to step out if somebody wants to do it. Uh, and and the alternate position is a great way to learn and and not be bound to every meeting if you you know there because because we'll be still under a quorum if you want to attend. So uh, just kind of throw that out as options. Uh, let me know if you're interested and I'll uh, be ready to make that appointment next month for you. Um, and then I wanna quickly uh, take a moment and say thank you to Commissioner Mejia uh, uh, for, be, for her service to the Clean Air Agency Board. Uh, you came on, I think, right when you were elected uh, and you you learned pretty quick and you've been a great contributor. And I know there's been some uh, sticky stuff in Thurston County that you've helped, uh, you know, between between our staff and 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 your staff to to help, you know, have positive outcomes. So uh, just on the behalf of the organization and the board, I wanted to thank you for everything you've contributed to us. Thank you so much, Jim. I uh, or Chair Cooper. I really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure serving uh Orca and serving with the rest of the commissioners and uh, council members, it really, I'm so thankful to the staff for walking me through this uh, whole process and uh, just teaching me so much. Um, it was definitely a, a big learning curve for sure, but I've enjoyed my time here. And, and for folks who are from smaller commission counties, uh, you know, Carolina has the the pleasure of of having a reduced workload because they have five members now, and that I'm I'm excited for you because you can have a little bit of balance, and I hope that someday every county has the option to ask its ask its voters for that because it's it's a crime to only have three, I think. So yeah, yeah. It, it sounds good in the beginning, but you wait and see. Her workload will fill back up again. Uh, this the amount of papers I carry is in direct correlation with the size of my briefcase. One and, minute in time. Yeah, right. Yeah, for sure. They'll fill it again. Uh, and thank you very <laughs> much for what you did here. I've appreciated you coming on and I've definitely appreciated your insight and your support on some of the things that we've had to face. So thank you. Okay. Greg, finance committee update. Yeah, not a lot to report. You know, we're we're doing great. The 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 revenue expenditure documents were in the packet for everyone as well. We went over them in some detail with Lynn and, you know, we're doing better than we should be. Revenues are ahead of the 50% of where we should be through the fiscal year and uh, expenditures are lagging behind. So that's great. We're going to address a, a budget um, appropriation that or adjustment that we had we knew was coming to, to really mostly address the staffing. And it's great to see even in that that we are reducing the uh, expected drain on our reserves with with the uh um the the great revenue uh forecast so i mean the biggest takeaway that i had was that jim and randy both uh spent the whole time praising lynn and jim says he's, she's his model for uh budgeting in his as a day job as well and i think that's um it's it's a really great committee and i would encourage anyone else that's interested in, in participating and learning a little bit more what what's under the hood uh, to join us our next meetings in april so reach out to jim if you're interested in joining the finance committee and uh, unless there's any questions i'll 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 sure i guess turn it over to lynn i think for going more into the the budget ask or is it jeff i forgot now we're gonna do that a little bit later greg okay not very much later but <laughs> any questions for greg okay then that takes us to public comment. Do we have anyone in the room? No, okay. 
Anything we should know about from the public? Uh, nope, we haven't received anything uh, related to the meeting or anything that uh, to bring to the board at this point. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so then uh, I am looking for a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. I'll second. A motion and a second. Any questions, comments, or polls? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Ah, and then that takes us to Lynn and Jeff with the 2024 budget amendment that we discussed in the fall. And uh, today we'll tee it up. And after uh, their presentation and discussion, uh, I'll look for you to uh, consider action to open a public comment period for hopeful adoption of that amendment next month. So, uh, Jeff, are you going to tee it up? Sure. Let me. So, thanks, everybody. So, so thanks, Jim. Um, so, so Dan, could you bring up the share the uh, the the budget amendment document up on the screen just so we've got that. Um, so Lynn and I shared back in September that we would be coming to you about now, about halfway through our budget year with the budget amendments. Um, things are unfolding pretty much as we had planned and as we discussed last September. Again, as we discussed, there's a lot of sort of changes with the staff in terms of, of staff retiring. Uh, that's provided an opportunity to do a little bit of reorganization. But because ORCA, about 80% of our expenditures are related to uh, salaries and benefits, it doesn't take much adjusting there to exceed our budget authority or it, it, the budget authority in our in our current fiscal year budget. So we're coming to you with this uh, budget amendment of 135, just over $135,000. Um, again, there's a lot of detail, this uh, a summary sheet here that takes you through some of the the, the, some of the detail, and then there's the budget sheets behind it uh, explaining more detail. So with that, I mean, so basically the news is really good. Um, uh, work is in a very strong financial position, um, and I'll hand it off to Lynn to, to take you through a couple points, uh, a couple maybe high-level details, and then we're either one of us are available to answer any questions that you have on this. Okay. Well, good morning, all. Nice to see you. Yes, Happy New Year. And thank you, Carolina, for all your past efforts and contributions to ORCA. Thank you. So this is a budget amendment for fiscal year 2024, running July 1, 23 through June 2024. And we are uh, asking for a budget amendment that equals $135,605. Um, basically, the uh, reason behind this is we have budgeted a forecast of expenditures through the end of our fiscal year, and that it reveals a variance between our budget appropriations and our projections for expenditures. And with increased revenue from a few revenue sources uh, that are highlighted in our budget, We've also combined uh, the engineering manager and the compliance manager position into one. We've added two positions, the air quality specialist and the financial specialist, bringing ORCA's FTEs to a little over 19. Um, also, we are not drawing on the administrative contingency re reserve by adding the additional expenditures to the budget. For the revenue, Basically, we received additional revenue in our core grant, uh, which was uh, occurred after the board had approved our original budget for 2024, adding 8,100. We also received a slight decrease in our state core of uh, right under 3,000. There is adjustment in our ARP, the American Rescue Plan, uh, near year end, June of 2023, we had a small payout to a couple contractors, vendors. Uh, that's being reflected. Did a little bit of house cleaning too during the course of this budget amendment. Uh, typically, you wouldn't see these small dollar amounts. We also added $60,000 in our uh, new source review notice of construction revenue. Year to date, we've already exceeded our budgeted amount of 104,000. And so we did add $60,000 of additional 
revenue to cover the expenditures that uh, we'll be going over. Um, and engineering staff are dealing with several sources requiring additional time due to the complexity of the projects. And they're also seeing an increase in the number of permit applications from ex existing sources to expand and make improvements at their facilities, which is great, good news economically. You wanna see that. We are uh, also adding $130,000 in penalty money that uh, we received already in the fiscal year. We've also earned additional interest income uh, as a result of Thurston County doing a great job investing our daily balance and receiving a higher return on our investments. We've already exceeded actually our interest income for the year. So um, that number could actually result in much higher um, dollar amount. So overall, ORCA is projecting an additional 201,000 in revenue. Based on that, uh, our expenditures of 135,000, obviously less than what our revenue is coming in, we're gonna be reducing our general fund contingency draw by about 65,000. Why? Well, when you get into the expenditures, uh, our expenditures amount to 135,000 and payroll being the largest expense of 97,000, uh, the rest is non-payroll operational costs. The 97,000 represents a, uh, it's the difference between a couple of staff members who are retiring. One has retired, one is retiring uh, at the end of February and the uh, cost of adding the new staff to the agency. So what basically, in a nutshell, the reduction of the two retirees of $117,000, and then you add the dollar amount of $174,000 to our um, salaries and benefits, the cost is resulting of $97,000. Hopefully, I'm not sure if I made myself clear on that, but the difference of the two retirees and the cost of new hires is a $97,000 difference. Uh, for non-payroll, we're adding about uh, $35,000 to the budget, 19,000 being the largest of the non-payroll expense is the cost of uh, organ uh, some furniture and uh, um, goodness, cost of refiguring ORCA for the new staff, purchasing some new chairs for our new staff and the new front office reception counter. In addition, you know, again, there's some small ones, uh, minor increase for staff travel, uh, purchasing additional uh, laptops and software licenses for our new staff, uh, staff training, attending essential training, asbestos, smoke school, adding uh, additional cell phone for our air quality specialist position, minor adjustment in our insurance, advertising for the additional uh, positions at the agency. We've also seen our quarterly and annual monitoring costs go up with our security company. Uh, consistent with the revenue under the ARP program, we uh, reduced the dollar amount by $2,159. That was paid out the end of last fiscal year. And then only math project, we have an MOU with them. And this is basically the net difference of the balance of their MOU. So the expenditures amount to $135,605. Uh, with the revenue of 201 and the expenditures of 135, again, there's a reduction to the need to pull from our administrative contingency reserve. Of Scroll a little bit down, Dan, please. There, there you go. Oh, thank you. I'm on another screen, sorry. <laughs> um, and so basically the contingency funds, uh, they're set aside for uh, board directed uh, uh, projects and or specific authorizations or for emergencies. Uh, we did talk about uh, looking at the set aside that is established by the board of 20% of expenditures. The finance committee will be looking at more detailed uh, considering uh, increasing that. Two months is not always a great amount of time in the event emergencies do happen or catastrophic 
situations occur, which we're never hopeful for. So that's basically the income and uh, revenue expenditures and appropriations summary. Any questions at this point from the board before moving a quick glance at the fund balance? Hearing none, we'll go ahead and move to the fund balance. So we're focused on uh, the last two columns, amendment one, um, we've already basically summarized what we're doing here in terms of some uh, expenditures and revenue. The last column shows that on July 1, 2023, we started with 2224000 Considering the revenue we just discussed and expenditures, we anticipate ending June 30th, 2024 with $2,120,000 in our fund uh, uh, at Thurston County Treasurer's Office. It also reflects us using the 150,982 contingency draw. It also reflects all the board directed uh, contingency and capital funds set aside. It also identifies the undesignated fund balance of a little over 1,090,000. So that sums up our fund balance, our request for a budget amendment that'll take us through June 30th, 2024. Uh, we hope to seek approval from the board and um, the public on this. Any questions? And I'll just I'll just add that we included an, an, uh, an ORCA organizational chart in the packet as well, since a lot of the some of the expenses have to do with again, uh, uh, well, the new positions are the two that are outlined in red there. Um, but um, again, this also shows the com shows the combination of the former compliance and engineering managers into one position. Um, so the org chart was included in there as well. Mm -hmm. Questions for staff. Randy, you and oh, I got Robin, go ahead. I didn't have a question. I was wondering if you were ready for a motion. Yeah, I think I saw Randy unmute. So let me see if you go ahead, Randy. No, I was going to do the motion. I I am perfectly good with Robin stepping on up. <laughs> well, let me just Mr. Chair, make sure there's no questions. Any any okay. questions? <laughs> Largely, we've discussed this. Okay, and then just the process reminder that we the motion needs to be around opening a public comment period through our next scheduled business meeting, uh, where we will have a public hearing and uh, consider action. Mr. Chair, I move that we set a public hearing to review the fiscal year 24 budget amendment during our next business meeting in February. And open public comment for the net until then. And open public comment between now and then. Perfect. I'll second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Great. Thank you, Lynn, well, and everybody who worked on this. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, too. Thank you, Lynn and Jeff. It's a big lift to get us here. And um, the Finance Committee is looking at the three-year outlook and and kind of the moving parts of some other settlements. And I, you know, I, I think we're in a very good financial position uh, for our organization. Um, and you know what? Because... It, you know, one thing I want to—I've been thinking about when we we're looking at all of those uh, reports during the finance committee—is, you know, every other government in the world was um, elevated by the COVID funds, and we weren't, and we came out sitting in a really good place. And um, I'm struggling in my other work uh, how to, you know, fix what happened because of that federal money. So, <laughs> good job, everyone. Jim, I'd, I'd, just, I'd just like to say uh, thank you to the staff for all of this work. This not only was a lot of work, but they presented it in a way that I've, I've been able to follow it all along the way. And if I had, you know, I came with some questions and they, they were answered. It's almost like anticipating what, you know, we need to know and how we need to be proud of what we're doing here. And, um, and I, I am. Not only did they present good work, they had good news. So <laughs> that's great for a budget report. So thank you. 
Yeah, your your combination of the narrative and the spreadsheet is really helpful for all of the learning styles, I think. So yeah. uh, great. Glad to hear. Glad to hear. Good. Cool. Okay, hearing nothing else, we'll go ahead and move on to Robert for a proposed rule change regarding gasoline dispensing facilities. Hello, sir. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Dan, do you want to pull up the uh, briefing memo here? Uh, those that might want to see it here. Uh, so I was going to kind of walk you through what we're proposing and uh, answer questions. So uh, we are recommending that to, uh, we establish a de minimis for registration for gasoline dispensing facilities. I mean, that's the the yes, direction is. here we're providing. And uh, what you see, well, we'll get to the attached here in a moment. So there, yes, there is a budget impact. And uh, at the moment, it's approximately $7,500, a reduction in budget in income. So uh, we're talking about 24 stations that we've identified that under this rule could be removed from the registration program. Uh, it's also worth noting that 14 of those are government refueling stations uh, located pretty much in the edges of our um, jurisdiction. Uh, the one thing about government owned refueling stations is generally their maintenance is top notch. Uh, they don't, you know, because they don't have the public that doesn't care. <laughs> Um, these are people that uh, get their gas here and move on to do more of their work. So uh, there is a corresponding reduction in inspections as well, uh, which also reduces our expenses. So something to keep in mind. On the environmental impact, uh, we're not changing what the rules are that apply uh, to these facilities. And I should mentioned there is a correction in what you have in front of you. It's actually ORCA rule 8.12. Um, I dropped the two off when I did this. So uh, that is our gas station rule. Those rules will still apply to these facilities. The difference is whether or not they would be included in the registration program. Um, for background, uh, historically, ORCA was prevented from regulating gasoline facilities. And with the uh, change in the WAC, uh, they created 173-491, uh, Washington Administrative Code, uh, became effective in 1991. And ORCA, like all the other locals said, okay, we're gonna register these guys and uh, do what we need to do. Uh, the At the time, and I am the one that was responsible for it and <laughs> back then. And uh, for, they were treated as kind of separate entities at the time. They were not included with our other registered sources. And uh, quite honestly, it was an oversight on my part to not include a de minimis in the reg uh, regulation 4.1, the uh, registration rule. So this is an intent to fix that oversight. And uh, as, as Lynn was mentioning earlier that somebody else is about to retire, well, that would be me. So I'm trying to get some of these things tied up before I go. Uh, uh, as far as a proposed timeline here, uh, we're looking at, uh, you know, again, seeking your permission to move forward. Uh, should we decide to do that? Uh, we would be filing a CR 102 with the code revisor's office. Uh, you would have a public hearing on this amendment in March at your board meeting. And then uh, if approved, we would go ahead and file the CR 103 and it, rule would be effective in April. Uh, actual implementation, we are still working on some of what that would look like. It would allow a facility, Dan, can you scroll down just a little bit more there, top of page two? So the red there, uh, you see coming up, is the exemption that we're proposing. And uh, the intent would be that for those facilities that we currently have registered that are 
uh, below 50,000 gallons of throughput, that they would have the option to um, submit paperwork to be removed from the registration program. Uh, also, it would apply to the new facilities that are going in. So we are permitting uh, stations that have 10,000 gallons of storage. And uh, uh, some of those are, again, these very small outlying facilities that they could, um, after three years, they could submit paperwork and say, you know, we're not even close to this. We would like to be out of the program. So uh, it is set up with some future in mind. Uh, the, if the full text there, the Dan, the top there, so you'll see those are all the exemptions that we have, and it goes on there for a couple of pages. And we're adding number 91 here, which is the gas station dispensing facilities. So that is the uh, goal of what we're up to here. Um, and, uh, you know, also for some comparisons, uh, generally these locations are um, quite rural and have good separation from surrounding residences. Uh, also, we talk about environmental impact. Uh, again, I don't expect the facilities to change emissions, but uh, a 50,000 gallon throughput station is emitting, give or take, but about 500 pounds of VOC a year. Um, compare that to your auto body shop, which are generally, you know, in town, these facilities are generally pretty rural, but, uh, Oh, thanks, Dan. Uh, so the um, what I was going to mention is auto body shop. You know, those are typically permitted to put out you know fifteen hundred pounds of VOC, and then we have the majors. Um, one a very large one here in Olympia that's over a hundred tons of VOC a year. So. In that manner, I believe that exempting these out of registration makes sense. Um, so up on the screen right now, this is the uh, facilities that um, could, based on our data right now, be um, exempted out of the registration program. Again, you'll see a lot of very small facilities. Um, half of them are government. The other half are uh, pretty widespread um, facilities. So that I think is uh, what I have for you here. Um, and uh, do we have questions? Go ahead, Robin. Yeah, if, if one of these organizations that's on this list requests exemption under this new rule we're going to promulgate, do they have to report on the throughput of gasoline per year? How are we going to track if they grow and they end up coming up above that 50,000? That is a fair question, and it is a consideration. Uh, these are places that we do drive by periodically as we go you know, about work in our jurisdiction. And if we can see that they are growing, uh, and that's usually just how busy are the dispensers. Uh, then we can go back and look at it. We do not require gas stations right now to even report to us. We do collect that information during inspections. Got it. Uh, yeah. And oh, do sorry. we need? Go ahead, Robin. Is this another thing we're going to need a hearing on? It it would be a public hearing uh, in March. Thank you, Jeff Myers. Uh, thanks, Robert. Uh, the language of the exemption applies to gasoline dispensing facilities. Um, uh, does the exemption uh, address other forms of fuel like diesel or marine fuel? It, uh, we specifically do not, ORCA does not regulate diesel, uh, kerosene, uh, jet fuel, any of that. Um, it does apply to marinas that are dispensing gasoline. Um, if they are above the 
Well, right now it apply. We are we have applied it to them. Uh, most of them do not do a very big throughput. Thanks. Other questions? My, my question was the same as Robin's, I think. If we're not making anyone else certify their volume, I guess it doesn't make sense to do that for the really smalls. Um, I am curious, though, how, you know, do we have a random inspection program for ensuring that emission controls are still in place, or is, will that become complaint-driven? So... Uh, yes, in effect, um, and some of these don't even meet this criteria, but those that have more than 10,000 gallons of underground or above, above, <laughs> of gasoline storage, uh, they are still subject to that rule 8.12, and that 8.12 has um, gasoline testing. So they are still required to have an independent firm come in and test the tightness of their tanks. Those reports do come to us. So um, if, if they have a, a, a failed drop tube system uh, where they actually put the gas into the underground storage tank, there's gaskets in those. If that is failing, these tests will determine that. And oh, cool. as part of that report to us, uh, some of these they can fix promptly. The, the testers that are on site that, well, we carry gaskets in the truck. We'll put a new gasket in, retest it, and it passes. So um, some of the other ones are, are <laughs> bigger or far bigger problems that they cannot fix at the same time. But it is still a requirement that they have annual testing done for ORCA's issues as well as Department of Ecology. Okay. So they still have to prove the emission side, regardless of the registration side. That's what I'm hearing. Okay. Correct. Yes. That's awesome. Okay. Any other questions for Robert? Okay. So I believe that we need a motion to direct staff to launch the rulemaking process. Is that enough of a motion for you, Robert? Yes. Okay. So moved. Need a second. second. I'll second. Okay. A motion and a second to direct uh, ORCA staff to launch the rulemaking process as described. Uh, is there any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, sir, for buttoning things up. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, that takes us to our director's reports and we'll go right back to Robert. Since I'm here, I'll stay here. Uh, you, you'll notice that the report is uh, fairly short this month. Uh, we're finishing up the December, which is a slow time of year. And as Jeff mentioned, we have a, a new inspector on staff now to uh, start training up uh, and get some training into him so he can go out and uh, do good things as well. Uh, on a practical basis, he probably won't be in the field for another couple of weeks. And even at that point, it'll be uh, with one of the other inspectors. So there's a lot going on, but uh, the good news that I have is, you know, it, it was a slow month, which is a positive thing in our life. So uh, I don't know if you have any questions of me. I really don't have anything else for you today. So, questions for Robert. So I have one, Robert. Um, I'm I'm out, I'm watching a project in Rochester. In the, the school district owns an early 1900s gym that's been closed for decades because of asbestos. And they've asked for groups to put in proposals to remediate and, and operate the facility, like in the nonprofit world. Do you know of any funds that are out there for historic structures for uh, abatement? I cannot think of any. Um, I guess the first question I would ask, though, is the why, why would they need to abate it? I mean, schools are full of it right now. 
I thought that was weird too. I mean, there must be more to the story. So I don't I have would, to take up time here, but I, I would, I would, yeah, want to hear the rest of the story. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, then let's move on to uh, Jennifer for engineering. Good morning. Um, so if Dan is going to be sharing the uh, report, there it is. Uh, I just wanted to highlight a couple of uh, permits this um, month. Uh, we did issue a permit to Alta Forest Products, which was for an, exp it's located in uh, Mason County uh, for an expansion. And they did get a voluntary limit on VOC so they could stay out of the Title V program. Uh, so that uh, we received, uh, didn't receive any comments on that. We're able to issue that. Um, we also have a public hearing coming up next week for Pacific Northwest Renewable Energy, which is a new a proposed pellet mill in Grays Harbor. Um, the public hearing, I believe, is on Tuesday evening, and we will uh, the public uh, comment period will end on the 18th. We have already received some public comments, so and we are expecting some people to be present at the hearing. So. Um, in addition to permitting, engineers have been working on um, emission inventory. We did finalize the 2022 inventory and successfully reported that to EPA. And the forms for 2023 have been mailed out to those to the sources and are starting to come back already. So, uh, does anybody have any questions on any of these permits? Questions for Jennifer. Okay. Keep up the great work in all this transition. <laughs> yeah, I'd just like to jump in and thank Jennifer and the team with, uh, again, we're an engineer short right now. And so, and, you know, if you've been following our NSR revenue, it really comes in cycles. At this point, last fiscal year, we were way behind and our, our NSR fees were very low and now they're very high. What's part of our budget amendment is adding some additional revenue due to the NSR activity. And so Jennifer, Lauren, and Aaron are just really busy right now, just trying to keep keep up with everything. And so really appreciate all that they're doing. So keep up the great work. Okay, Odell for monitoring. See if I cursed her or not. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, I can. There you go. <laughs> you did not curse me. All right, so I'm going to share uh, this presentation. And can you all see that? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, I'm going to be giving the air monitoring report for December and then a brief summary just you know, putting the entire year into sort of a context of, of previous years um, and looking at that. So, um, so December, we are actually showing mostly good air quality, which is always pleasant in the winter months. We get, um, historically, we've gotten more um, wood stoves and more and colder, more stagnant periods that would lead to elevated PM 2.5 in several of our regions. And we just didn't see that. Um, that could be partly because December was one of the warmest months or December's on record for a, long, for a while. It didn't even really feel like winter arrived um, until this week. So uh, good there. Um, you'll notice we did have a couple of moderate days in Port Angeles. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. And then we had one unhealthy for sensitive groups um, in Shelton with a with a daily average of 37.4 micrograms per meter cubed. So that that was unusual for us. Um, I actually thought that our analyzer had broken, but this is what um, the PM 2.5 looked like on that day in downtown Shelton, where you'll see right after noon, we had uh, PM 2.5 skyrocket up to about 300 micrograms per meter cubed which is in the hazardous category. And it sat up there for almost an hour. Um, I thought the monitor had broken. So I, I called the fire station where the monitor is at figuring if there was a fire or a house fire nearby, they would know about it. And they said, no, it's just really, really foggy out. And so we think, you know, a lot of the wood stoves must be really degrading our air quality. And I said, no, no, <laughs> this number is way too high for wood stoves. 
Um, so I was trying to figure out what was going on, but I verified that the monitor was working. And um, around that time, we got a call from DNR. And it turned out that there had been a, a land clearing burn outside of town um, that DNR had, had permitted. And they saw that those numbers went up as well and the wind direction. And so sent a crew out. Um, so this is a map of where our fire state, the fire station is here with the blue stars where we were recording those numbers. And here was the location of the fire. And so with the wind direction from the Southeast, we had a plume that was fumigating pretty much all of Shelton. And you can see that it stayed up, oops, stayed up there for most of the day. Um, the DNR crew said by the time they got out there that the burner had initiated actions on their own to mitigate smoke and started uh, um, putting out the fire and then tearing apart the piles with machinery around um, 2 p.m. It just took that long because it was so stagnant and so foggy. It just took that long for the for the smoke to clear out. So, um, you know, talking with DNR a little bit and we have a final report issued where the, the burner said they they would not initiate burns or not approve burns when we they saw that kind of fog um, forming. So uh, hopefully that won't happen again, but you never know, sometimes these things do happen. So that was one event that we had in Shelton last month. Um, other monitoring news, you know, the same typical stuff. We did a, a monthly trip to Chica Peak for general maintenance. Uh, service on our beta attenuation monitor at Lacey. Um, I've talked to Ecology. Right now, we're just sort of operating it as um, a test site, but we have decided that we'll, it will become an official state federal equivalence monitor starting in April, um, which is the, the start of the new grant. Um, and so that will be our ORCA's only federal equivalence monitor to be operating uh, in our region. Uh, which we think is, is a good thing, especially with as the, the county grows and the population that it represents is growing as well. I also did some site visits to Aberdeen, Port Angeles, and Raymond, and then just continuing to work on reports and data analysis. So air quality summary for the year, um, you can see here in the right-hand column, the percent data completeness that we got at each site. You'll notice uh, Chica Peak down around 84%. That's partly because of the, um, the upgrades that we made this summer. So the site was down for several weeks and then uh, Chica Peak just being Chica Peak, sometimes we lose power or site, you know, things go wrong and it takes me a little while to get up there. So that's, that's good though, we have over 75%. Um, Port Angeles will also notice we have 83% data collection. We had some problems with the monitor uh, up there throughout the year. And actually, Rob is up there right now trying to solve some problems with it. So hopefully he's not trying to contact me on Teams while I'm talking to you, because I was just chatting with him before I started this report. Um, and then the only other site uh, where we had low data collection uh, was Raymond, and that was because we uh, moved the site back to Raymond, and then we had some issues with the monitor trying to get that up, and that had some repeated visits out there um, trying to get that monitor operational. So I mentioned, uh, I'd put this into context. I know this is a lot of numbers and a lot, uh, very busy slide, but really what I wanna point out here, uh, 2020, 2021, 2022, and 2023. So the last four years, um, one column is with wildfire smoke days included. And the other column is if we didn't have any wildfire smoke intrusions included. And what we're looking for our green check marks. That means we're meeting the state air quality goals at all of our sites. And the red uh, X's means we are not meeting those air quality goals at that site. So you can see with the wildfire smoke in 2020, it was a very bad year, didn't meet it at any of our sites. Um, but when we don't include wildfire, we are meeting um, our air quality goals at all of our sites. The orange check marks are when we get close. Uh, we don't go over that 20.4, but we are kind of approaching it. And um, you'll see that for Shelton, uh, Port Angeles here, even with no wildfire smokes, and then Lacey uh, with wildfire smoke. So one thing to note about Port Angeles is that lately it is not bad, but it is statistically significantly higher than most of our other sites. So what is going on in Port Angeles? And it is location, location, location. Um, this is a map of a very windy 
uh, typical windy winter day just from a couple days ago in our region. And you'll, you can see that the winds are, you know, between 10 and 20 miles per hour uh, almost everywhere, except for Port Angeles, where you see this pocket of stagnation. And that has to do with where the mountains are with respect to the predominant wind direction. And so you get this sort of pocket of stagnation sitting over Port Angeles. Um, we do have a higher number of wood burning furnaces, stoves and fireplaces uh, up there in the winter. We have, uh, and Dan can talk about this, but we've um, extent, expanded our wood stove change out program to include Calm County. So we're hope, hoping to mitigate this a little bit. And again, uh, this low wind speed, cold air and more wood stoves create a higher ambient PM 2.5. And, and this is a very persistent feature that we see in the winter. And one of those reasons is if you look at the winter winds versus the summer winds in Port Angeles, predominantly the winds are coming here from the south and these dark blue um, and blues are low wind speeds. So you see that, um, and this data is for in Port Angeles. So you see that when we have those southerly winds, they're, they're typically pretty low. Um, whereas in the summertime, we get these northwesterlies and westerlies and they kind of just beep along straight and clear everything out. So we don't see that uh, as often. And that is actually all I have for you guys, unless you have any questions. Um, that is my report. Questions for Odell? Remind me, I, I feel like I've asked this and I can't remember the answer, Odell. Does DNR send us a regular report about burn permits in our region? So DNR has a burn portal and it has a calendar and you can access any of the permits with the map. And so I, and then they also have a, a burn call on Monday mornings and Thursday mornings at 9 a.m. And I always call into those. Um, they don't always talk about all the burns, but it's just a good idea to get an, it's a good way for us to get an idea of where those burns are and also to know when they're DNR burns, because if they are holding the permit, then if we get complaints, we can just send them off to DNR. Um, this one, I'm not sure if it was addressed or not. Uh, and the size of the permit, I think Vaughn said that if it's below, there's a certain size they have where they don't approve or deny the permit. So I think that the size of this was for a, a lower, a smaller burner, you know, hundred tons or 200 tons, I think. And so that wasn't subject to approval or deny that permit. And he said, looking at the weather conditions now, they probably would have denied it. Um, so yeah, there were some lessons learned and there is, a, a, if you're interested, I do have the full report um, from DNR uh, that talks about what, what went on there, but yeah. Thank you, that's good. That's really helpful information, I think. So I'm glad we're watching it and hopefully they can tighten up that rule around. Um, it seems like we've had a lot more stagnant air this, this fall and winter than we've had in a lot of other years too, so. We have, but the good news is, is that our air quality hasn't uh, responded the way it has in the past. So we are still maintaining pretty good air quality in most of our, our sites. So I think that, you know, says a lot to our wood stove change out program, you know, less, less emissions is, is great. Um, but yeah, we're just not seeing the numbers that we used to about 10, 10, 15 years ago. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, keep up the great work, and we'll go to Dan for communications. Thanks. And uh, yeah, we have had a lot of foggy days. Uh, fortunately, fog doesn't necessarily translate into very strong inversions. So even though we have some fog, I think some of the, the heat of the smoke from chimneys is going up. But as Odell said, we do have a strong wood stove program. Uh, I'll start with that. Uh, we have even though we didn't get started until mid to late October, the way that the state contracts came out after you know the budget year started, we just didn't get the, the grant in place or the state didn't. Anyway, since mid October, we have 54 jobs approved in our six counties. Uh, and that's that's pretty remarkable given that this time of year, people aren't usually anxious to pull their heat source out of their house. Uh, so we've got a lot of people, uh, about half of those are recycle awards, uh, which is all that's available in 
a significant part of our jurisdiction. So that's basically paying $500 to remove and destroy an old uncertified wood stove or fireplace insert. Uh, that's occurring, like I said, in all six counties uh, in Thurston, Mason, Eastern Jefferson and Clallam. We have a replacement program that allows uh, additional funding if they switch to uh, zero emission heat pumps, they can get $2,000 or $1,000 if they switch to uh, cleaner devices like natural gas, propane, or pellet stoves uh, in those four counties, or, or two full counties and two half counties. Uh, ductless heat pumps is still the most popular replacement uh, in the program. People are, are loving the idea of having zero emission heat and cooling in one unit. So that's getting a lot of, of work. Um, let's see, At pellet stoves options is uh, becoming more popular. It's the first year we offered that outside of, of the Shelton area, uh, which does not have piped natural gas as an option. So we offered pellet stoves in all of the replacement zones uh, as a alternative to the, the higher use of uh, CO2 emitting natural gas. So it has a little bit higher uh, PM emission, but a much lower uh, CO2 emission. So it's, it balances out that, that climate change. Uh, and thinking about that, if you, I'll share this, I, I shared with the board uh, a document that I think Jimmy requested a few months back of looking at comparisons of the emissions from different heat sources. So we have uh, the PM emissions, and the, this data is all outside of ORCA, but it's from sources we trust. The first is Puget Sound Clean Air provided relative emissions of fine particles from wood burning fireplace. That's an open hearth fireplace, no controls, whatever, just a fire in a in a box with straight up the chimney. Uh, going to electric heat, which has zero emissions. So it, it tells you, and it's actually almost impossible to calculate exactly how much pollution comes out of those fireplaces. We can make some good uh, models to look at how much is coming out of certified wood stoves or uncertified wood stoves. Um, but you can see the, the from ORCA's standpoint, the ambient air impacts of each of those fuels then we found uh, some data on the greenhouse gas emissions from from those uh, looking at an average U.S. house. So again, this data is applicable across the U.S., not just to the Pacific Northwest, although I did try to uh, tailor it more to us, especially on the electric heat, since Pacific Northwest electric grid uh, is so much cheaper than the majority of the U.S. Uh, so we did come up with that data and shows that electric heat is uh, because of where our electricity is generated, uh, we have far fewer uh, greenhouse gas emissions from our uh, electric generation uh, processes here in the Northwest. We don't have, I guess we still have the one coal facility, but that's on its way out. Uh, and then the cost comparison of what each of these costs on an annual basis. Uh, so you can see electric furnaces and that I did not balance to the Pacific Northwest. So that would actually be a little lower in the Pacific Northwest. But looking at, at the other numbers, uh, this came from uh, the U.S. Energy Information Administration. So that document is in your, your packet uh, and that kind of shows where we're going with our wood stoves, uh, why we're looking at some of the things we're looking at in terms of balancing uh, ambient air pollution, PM, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and then the, the cost of homeowners, things we're all taking into consideration. Other than that, uh, we have the public hearing slated for the permit Jen talked about. Uh, we still have a pretty active outdoor burn permit program uh, about 1,900 people have applied for permits in uh, Thurston County through our, our uh, self-issuing online permit system. Uh, 
you'll notice the asterisk uh, that was expanded last year or the year before into uh, Fire District 12 in Grace Harbor County. Uh, and the fire marshal in Grace Harbor County uh, initiated some discussions with Robert, I believe, about making that program countywide. Uh, and what quest started with questions about whether an individual fire district had the authority to have their own permit program through us or with us. And it turns out they don't want to take the program away from Fire District 12. They they want to look at implementing it for the entire county. So we would run the, the online free permit program for all of Thurston County, as well as all of Grace Harbor County in the future is, is what we're looking at. And then uh, I sit in on a lot of those calls Odell mentioned and uh, one really exciting thing for, for me is uh, our sister agency to the north, Puget Sound Clean Air Agency, finally has a new communications manager. Excuse me. And so I've been working closely with her as much as possible and, and trying to figure out where we can coordinate efforts and uh, share resources and share messaging so that we can do things like market our wood stove recycling program together for 10 counties instead of just our six and and working on some of the outdoor burn issues. Uh, smoke knows no boundaries. It, it goes county to county. So the more we coordinate and, and match our messaging, uh, the better we get the messages out. Any questions on any of this stuff? Questions for Dan. Thank you for the heating comps. I, in fact, I'd like to have you or Jeff come to my city council and present this. It's it's really great to have that all in one place. Um, and just one comment on it. I feel like the Puget Sound air graphic, which is great for them, isn't 100% accurate here because they have so much more hydro than we do. We still have the natural gas plant and the culpits uh, plant that are up and running. So like one sentence saying, you know, it's not quite apples to apples or take their graphic and make it your own and put a half a bubble on the electric heat one. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's a good point. Cause that, like I said, that's what I did with the greenhouse gas emissions, looking at yeah, totally. using the Pacific Northwest Energy's data and finding out that yes, our electricity, we have so much hydro and, and wind in Eastern Washington that we mitigate a lot of the problems that the Northeast U.S. has with all of their cold fire plants. We're sitting on, on a good path, but I just want to make sure that it's a little bit more tight for the all the people that are paying attention to all those so details. Certainly, if, if you want this <laughs> at, at, your, your, uh, at the city, we can certainly uh, update those numbers and, and work on a presentation for you. Cool. I will um, see if I can get a date. Thank you. All right. Great work, Dan. Uh, let's go to Lynn for financial services. Oh, oh, okay, so let's see. Sorry, I'm a little bit difficult to hear. Oh, there we go. All right. Hello again. Good morning. <laughs> um, again, I, I just want to express that thank you for the kind words uh, shared earlier regarding our financial position. We all work hard to um, meet expectations be accountable and as transparent as possible. Um, that's that's a requirement here. So um, I'm looking forward to having, hiring the financial services specialist here. Uh, the interviews are gonna be happening in a few weeks. Uh, again, I'm looking forward to that. This person who is hired is gonna just be uh, astounded and happy with all the fun tasks that <laughs> they get to do you know, from processing payroll to scheduling a crankcase heater install to filing an intent form with LNI to assisting us with the great tenants we have to applying for grants. So this is a, a going to be a fun job for whoever gets hired and a fun part of their life. So um, I just want to say thanks for uh, all your support board of directors. And again, thank you, Carolina, uh, for your your contributions to ORCA. That's all I have. If you have any questions, I'm happy to entertain any right now. 
a largely financed meeting. So anything else for Lynn? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Keep up the great work. Yes, sir. All right. That, that takes us to Jeff. Bring us home. Okay. Well, thanks. Um, so as Lynn mentioned, uh, we're, we've got interviews coming up for the financial specialist position. So excited about having that person on board. Um, also been, I've been, I and a couple others have been spending time filling the compliance manager position. So again, this is the, the, the reconfigured uh, compliance manager position. And so had interviews uh, last week and earlier this week, and I will be uh, making an offer here soon. So should have some news to share with you at the February board meeting. So, um, and then again, we've got some, we've got a, again, a, an, a, a vacant engineer position. We've got a vacant records clerk position. So for the time being, uh, <laughs> Hiring is going to be uh, pretty high on my priority list to to fill out the team to do the important work that the agency does. But again, I'm very happy to be in a financial place where we can afford the, to to fill these positions. Um, let's see. Also mentioned a couple times that we're getting ready for a public hearing next week, next Tuesday evening on the Pacific Northwest Renewable Energy Facility in Hoquiam. So I, I think, Jill, we talked last month about you being available that I just wanted to check in, make sure you were planning on being there on Tuesday evening. Sorry, trying to get my computer to cooperate here. That's all right. Tell me again the date. Uh, it's Tuesday, the uh, 16th um, at, I think, was it six o'clock um, at City of Hoquiam? Um, we, we can forward. I do, uh, I do have it on my calendar. Okay, great. Great. I, uh, will, I will definitely plan on being there. Great. Well, it'll be good to see you in person. Um, and as Jennifer mentioned, uh, we have been getting some public comments on that. And uh, so I'm sure that there will be some members of the public showing up to comment as well during the hearing. Comments, so we're, uh, negative comments? Oh, well, I am um, a, a variety. I mean, I think some that there are there are some negative comments or just questions about the I think the emission factors that we're using in the permit, some of the assumptions that, that, that we're making. Um, these facilities tend to be um, this is the first. Well, there's another one that's uh, in the, going through the permitting process with the Southwest Clean Air Agency. I'm not exactly sure where it's located, but but there, so, but there aren't a lot of these in the Pacific Northwest, but there are a number of them in the Southeast part of the US and they've been pretty controversial down there. And so some of what we've been hearing, I think is from folks in the Southeast. And so not sure how much that's translating to local interest or local comments, but uh, but we'll, we'll see. Um, and we will, of course, as part of the, Part of issuing the permit, we'll, we'll do a, a, a responsiveness summary um, and where we need to respond to all of the comments, answer any questions. And it might be that we get comments that require us to go back and look at our preliminary preliminary de determination. So we we'll just have to see how it goes. So, but but uh, that's a high a high priority. Uh, Lauren Weibru is the again. Mark Gooden was the engineer on that, um, but with his uh, departure from the agency, Lauren Weibru is the uh, is the permit writer on that. So she's going to be the staff giving the presentation um, at uh, the hearing next week, and the one work working through the any public comments that we get. Um, let's see other things. Of course, uh, this past Monday was the start of the legislative session. That's a short 60 day session. So um, looking, you know, watching that, I think I mentioned last month that there were a few things that I was watching um, still again, still early. Um, one thing kind of related to that, you might have seen um, at the end of December, there was some news stories, Seattle Times, other places. Uh, the Department of Ecology released a preliminary report on disproportionate air pollution impacts in overburdened communities around the state. Um, so this, so uh, they had earlier in the year, they had identified these 16 overburdened communities. Um, ORCA does not have any of them in our jurisdiction. So the work is not directly impacting us, but we're certainly watching it very carefully um, and you know, learning what we can from their efforts. And I uh, just wanted to mention that this, that this, is, this work is uh, work that's mandated and funded partly through the Climate Commitment Act. Um, so, uh, 
let's see, let me know. Actually, I, I can put a link to that uh, report in the chat if anybody's interested. Um, when I'm done here, I'll put that in the chat. Um, the other thing I just wanted to remind is that um, on the uh, on the agenda at the bottom, there's a link to um, the link to the February meeting and the board agenda planner, the document that lists the the um, what we've got coming up in each month. Just encourage you to take a look at that. And just wanted to remind you that in April we talked about having an in-person meeting. So please plan to join us here in Olympia. Um, for the board meeting at 10 a.m. in the morning. So we'll have a finance committee meeting prior, then we'll have the board meeting at 10. Then the plan is to have um, a break for lunch, and then we'll have a board uh, field trip in the afternoon. Been working with Silver Springs Organics uh, composting facility down by Rainier, uh, South Thurston County. Uh, so a board tour. It's a pretty interesting facility. Um, so I encourage you all to um, Keep that in mind. I think Debbie sent out a calendar hold, so you all should have that on your calendar. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that's it from me. If unless there are any questions on anything going on with the agency or anything we talked about, Greg, yes, yeah, thanks, Jeff. Uh, good report. I guess I was just wondering that the sixteen, you know, most burdened uh, communities was that. Is that the beginning of implementation of the HEAL Act? I guess my bigger question is wondering just how is ORCA going to interface with this implementation? Is there something, or are we going to be skipped because we don't have those communities? Well, we're, I mean, we're certainly following, I mean, the, the HEAL Act uh, impacted, uh, impact state agencies. Um, and, and so this is part of this. I mean, it was somewhat separate. I think the HEAL Act and the Climate Commitment Act passed the same legislative session, I think, in 2021. So there were a lot of connections between them. Um, and certainly as ecology roles has worked on this effort, um, they've been coordinating with the, the State Environmental Justice Committee that was formed as part of the HEAL Act. So there's a lot of overlap, um, but, uh, but there's not... Um, so again, keeping an eye on it, but but there's not specific mandates that I'm aware of for ORCA. But of course, we want we're learning from what other agencies are doing. And again, you know, we've you know, we're talking about the Pacific Northwest Renewable Energy Facility. We've been doing what we've been reaching out. There was an EJ component as part of that preliminary determination. Mark did an analysis to see, you know, is there any extra outreach we need to do? Any extra anything else and so we've been trying to be sensitive or you know to do what we can around those um or around reaching out more regarding our permits but if again certainly looking to our board if you have suggestions or things that you feel that we should be doing um around around that so did that answer your question Greg? okay yes thanks All right, well, if there's actually, let me put, uh, I just put a, um, a link to the Ecology Overburden Communities Report. Um, and one of the things that this report shows is that in the, and they work with Department of Health on this, but that shows that in these communities, actually there are, there are health impacts. Uh, folks in these communities do have higher incidence of asthma, have higher incidence of other health conditions that uh, are brought on, that are associated with levels of air pollution. So again, it's certainly something that, that, that we're looking closely at um, and uh, we'll be following it. And again, if the board has any questions or suggestions or thinking about how ORCA should be doing our work um, related to these concerns, let let us know. And then if there are no questions for me, then I wanted to hand it off to Jeff Myers um, to talk about a very favorable Court of Appeals decision that we recently got regarding the challenge regarding a challenge to basically the uh, executive director's authority to issue air quality permits. So Jeff, Thanks, let me Jeff. hand it off to you. Um, I do have uh, good news. Uh, the day after Christmas, we got a, a, a late Christmas present from the Court of Appeals. Uh, it was in the case of advocates for uh, a cleaner Tacoma versus Puget Sound clean air. Uh, and it was the case that raised the issue, which uh, we, we've talked about previously, about whether or not the board is itself required to consider and issue 
all notice of construction permit approvals or whether it can delegate that to staff, um, uh, namely the control officer, uh, which ORCA's rules do uh, by uh, authorizing the executive director to issue those permits. Um, the uh, Court of Appeals issued an opinion. It was 102 pages long. Um, the first 16 pages addressed the question of, of whether or not the permit was what's called ultra virus because it had to have been issued by the board rather than the control officer and the control officer's um, uh, delegee, the con compliance manager for Puget Sound Clean Air. Um, that was published as a, as a precedent setting opinion. The remainder of the opinion works through a bunch of technical issues um, issues like uh, whether or not the uh, CEPA compliance was good, whether the backed analysis was good. That's in the that's in the remainder of the uh, uh, 80, 85 plus pages. So in the published portion of it, which is, I think, what's relevant to this board, the court found that the Clean Air Act uh, has um plain language that specifically allows delegation of permitting authority to the control officer, who then may in turn subdelegate that authority to, uh, to staff. This rejects the argument that was made by the uh, Puyallup tribe, as well as the advocates for cleaner Tacoma, that uh, the board must issue those permits because the the language of one section of the Clean Air Act, uh, section 2210 uh, in uh, chapter 70A15, that section only refers to the board. A different section authorizes the uh, control officer to be appointed and to observe and enforce all the provisions of the uh, Clean Air Act and the uh, adoptions of the board in terms of its rules and its its ordinances and uh, resolutions. So the, the court found that the controlling language was in section 2300, which authorizes the uh, uh, control officer to issue those permits. Uh, so this is really good news. Uh, ORCA, as well as uh, the other uh, clean air agencies, filed an amicus brief uh, with the court that informed the court of uh, our practices, took the position that the Clean Air Act made no sense if it required you as part-time board members to try to make all the permit decisions, uh, and that uh, as a... Uh, 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 the, the court's opinion actually took note of our amicus brief, cited it, uh, and, and said that it wouldn't make any sense for the board as a part-time body without specific expertise to try to be making a lot of technical decisions under the Clean Air Act. So the court uh, accepted our arguments, agreed with us, agreed with Puget Sound Clean Air, that the permit process that they follow and that all the other clean air agencies follow um, was, was legal and appropriate under the Clean Air Act. So you do not have to issue all the permits. That's the good news. Oh, I'm gonna stay on the board now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if anybody has any questions about that, it was, it was a, um, a, a very lengthy process. The permit applications in this case that were filed by Puget Sound or, or Puget Sound Energy were filed in 2017. The, the they were appealed in 2019 to the Puget uh, to the Pub Pollution Control Hearings Board, and so it has taken five years for this to wind its way through the court process. Um, as as the uh, uh, it was a very controversial um, uh, liquid natural gas facility um, down in the uh, tide flats in Tacoma. Um, and, and it just took a long time. And that's why it's a 102 page opinion. But um, this particular issue was, was um, something that we kind of felt they were throwing um, up against the wall to see if it would stick. And it didn't. Just delay. Yeah. 
but the court found it was significant enough to to issue a published decision. So cool. I'm gratified by that. Greg, you had a Great. question. Yeah, I, I'm just with great news. I'm just wondering how, and sorry if you said spoke to this already, how wide does this precedent go? I mean, you know, there's kind of a battle, a war on the administrative state kind of across the entire country. And I'm wondering in Washington state now, is this going to translate to other areas or is this pretty specific just to- I think it's pretty specific yeah. for clean air agencies um, and, and, and interpreting the Clean Air Act itself. The argument that was made was a specific provision that said the board is authorized to issue permits and to notices of approval. Um, and, and so it, it's pretty much limited to that. But it does show, uh, I, I think, that the courts are favorably disposed to things that make sense um, so that agencies can function and do their jobs better rather than trying to take the literal language and and reach an absurd result. Joan? Yes, I was just, um, it's, that, this is very good news. And I'm, I'm just wondering, is there anything in there where, uh, in this case, Jeff or members of our staff would needs to come back to the board or is the board totally out of anything to do with this? Um, I, I think that our uh, rules are, um, appropriate as they are adopted um, in place as far as delegating the authority to Jeff or to his, we use the term authorized representative or um, uh, agent that Jeff appoints. Uh, one thing Jeff and I have talked about is um, looking at the issue of subdelegation of authority from the control officer down to staff, such as the new uh, uh, compliance manager that's being hired. Uh, and, and this is a good opportunity to take a look at, uh, as we're reorganizing, making sure our ducks are in a row, uh, uh, that, that we have identified the things that Jeff wants to delegate down to staff and that they are authorized and that there is a good record of the delegation from the uh, executive director down to the staff level and which staff level is is authorized to do those things. Brandy? I guess my question is, or is don't. the board taken completely out of this then? Or what is our what is our part in this and how do we get reports back? How do we how do we stay uh, you know updated on these things? Well I think it's one the of the engineering and compliance reports in our in our meeting every month. Yeah, I think that's that's the primary way that, that you guys get updated on uh, what decisions are being made, what applications are coming in under the uh, the new source review program. And uh, uh, but the board doesn't have a role uh, right. under ORCA's rules in making those permit determinations. Right. Uh, and 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 frankly, now the appeal process has been um, uh, delegated down to the staff level to to Jeff to, to hear the appeal process. So okay. um, that's, the only, that's the only route it would ever come before the board on a, on a permit decision. Okay. Randy. Um, Randy? Randy. Yeah, I want to disagree a little bit. I'm not a big fan of administrative law. Anybody knows me knows that. But at the same time, I want to say that uh, uh, how I disagree is, Joan, I think that's up to the board. Uh, we delegate those authorities. So the we board, hire. Yes, <laughs> the, it, it, it's not even that we hire, we also have the authority to take on what we want to, to be within our parameters. And I think that's what was allowed in that lawsuit was the ability for us to delegate and then the ability for the person below us to delegate and then the person below them. And that's what the courts found. It, Joan, it's still up to us. So if you find something that you'd like to, this is my opinion. If you find something that you would like to see, that you think that we should be still doing and that we should still be keeping our hands on, you're going to find me in the corner with you saying, I agree, because I always think we should never release all of our responsibilities. That's just not wise uh, governance. So, uh, and, and, and Randy, I agree with that, that the board ultimately, as the um, legislative authority for ORCA, yeah, has the, the ability rights. to write the rules, set the policies, and determine which things get delegated and which things don't. 
Totally. I absolutely agree with that. Jeff? So I just wanted to say that if if you have, if there's questions, yeah, well, as was mentioned, um, the purpose of the compliance reports, the, the, the engineering reports, and all the reports that we do every month is to keep you fully informed about the work that, that, that staff are, are doing here. And so if there are additional things that you want to hear about, uh, additional detail, by all means, let us know. Uh, again, want to have, want to make sure that you all are fully informed about what we're doing and so that you can uh, weigh in as as you feel appropriate. And the other thing I'll just mention is that, uh, yeah, Joan, your question was very good. Actually, Jeff and I talked about the delegation agreements yesterday and following this court decision, uh, Puget Sound Clean Air shared a, a delegation agreement that they've got between the their director and the board, as well as between their director and staff. And so we're gonna be using, looking closely at that, primarily the, the executive director to staff, level delegations. Um, and as Jeff mentioned, because of some of the reorg, we fear that now is a good time to do that. And we'll certainly, we can also look at the at the board to, to executive director, but we think that the rule does, rules do a pretty good job of clarifying those authorities. But, you know, as been discussed, certainly if you have any questions or there's anything that you want to know or want to, if there are any tweaks we need to make to that, we can certainly do that. And I didn't ask the question because I didn't think, you know, that the reports were thorough or you know, sure. anything like that. I just, when something gets highlighted like this, like, you know, Jeff is saying, it's uh, sometimes there's more of a watch on it or, you know, something else comes up or whatever. And I just, I think our reporting back to the board is, is very good. So, um, but if we do have questions, we I personally feel free to ask. Great. Any of yeah, if you want to do permits, Dan needs help with 54 wood stove removal uh, projects. So you could come in and spend some time in the office. I'm yeah. just kidding. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that is a, that was a really good discussion, actually. I, I'm trying to be light, but I, I really appreciate those questions. It, it, it helps us all understand where our power lies as, as a yeah. legislative authority that's not very normal. To be totally honest, so um, Dan, I'll I'll just note as maybe the agency historian, since I'm a history degree guy. Uh, back when we had our 40th anniversary, I went back and looked through a lot of the old board minutes from the the first years, and in 69, 70, 71, the board did approve and process every permit themselves. A uh, very small number of of regulated sources at the time, uh, but the board was in conference rooms for one to four days, it's nonstop. <laughs> so <laughs> it's probably a good thing to have some pass on. Well, I feel relieved. <laughs> <laughs> Every one of us is thinking we did not sign up for that. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Some counties still do that, so, <laughs> and cities for that matter. Okay, anything else, Jeff, on your end? Which Jeff? <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry, that was Myers, okay. but okay. I, no, I think good. that concluded. Okay, Johnston, anything closing? No. Okay. Um, good of the order. Anything for the good of the order? I just want to express thanks to Jeff and all the board for um, helping me with an application to the EPA Local Government Advisory Committee. Uh, I was declined. Uh, there was only five positions, uh, but I uh, just want to say thanks to to you all for supporting me in that effort, and we'll give it a shot next time, maybe. So, Sounds good. Okay. With that, hearing no further business before the Olympic Region Clean Air Agency, we are adjourned. Great. See you.